Hello, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government course online. Hey, welcome back. Today, our lecture is California State and Local Government, and I'm sure much to your joy, this is the last of our lectures for this course. So, well done. You made it this far. Congratulations. That's great. Today's lecture begins by looking at the history of our state, including its political evolution. We then look at the ideas and institutions of state government with an eye toward comparing it to what we've learned with the national government. So our seminar question then follows on that, asking what elements of California state and local government seem similar to those at the federal or the national level? What elements seem different? What do you imagine would account for these differences? As usual, we will reintroduce our seminar question at the end of today's lecture. So we're going to begin then with our little traips through the history of the state of California. Here we go. California's history is so romantic and filled with legend that it's fitting that the region was named for a fictional island paradise described in a 16th century Spanish romance, La Sergas de Spandion, which was popular when Spain's explorers first came to this part of North America's Pacific coast. You know, I always think of my late dad, who was born in New Jersey and moved to Los Angeles as an infant. A lifelong fan of the romance of California, he volunteered as a docent in retirement at historical venues well into his 80s. You know, my dad used to sit in on my lectures. Sometimes he would come with me to class, and he wouldn't hesitate to correct me on fine points, usually in front of the class. <laughs> Well, this one's for you, George. At first, California meant the peninsula on the west coast of modern Mexico, now known as Baja California or Lower California, and the Spaniards believed that they had discovered an enormous island. Only as they ventured further inland did the Spaniards find that California actually extended to join the continent, and they named this extension Alta California, the region that now forms the 31st state of the United States of America. Even in physical terms, the state is a region of extremes. It stretches 825 miles from its northwest corner on the 42nd parallel on the Pacific Ocean to its southeast corner on the 32nd parallel at the junction of the Gila and Colorado rivers. The winding shoreline contains 1,264 miles of beaches and harbors. Elevations run from nearly 15,000 feet at the peak of Mount Whitney to 282 feet below sea level at Death Valley. With both of these landmarks a little more than 50 miles apart in Inyo County. Well, the complex geologic forces behind these phenomena created a region with exceptionally complicated and challenging topography. On the west, the coast ranges of mountains run along the Pacific from the Oregon boundary to Marin County. The transverse and peninsular ranges continue the line of mountains along the Pacific below that point. The state's northern boundary runs through the Klamath and Cascade Mountains and the Modoc Plateau. Running south from these northern highlands, the Great Valley of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers extend 400 miles bounded by the coastal mountains on the west and the Sierra Nevadas on the east. The Sierra Nevadas, the state largest single mountain range, runs south for 400 miles from Lassen Peak to Tejon Pass in Los Angeles County. East of the southern Sierra Nevadas are the mountains of the Great Basin, where the Sierras and Basin ranges bounded on the south by the Mojave Desert. Below the Mojave lies the Salton Trough, the last of California's great geological regions, a desert created when Baja California Peninsula pulled away from the Mexican mainland. California's climates are as varied as her physical regions. There are heavy snows in the high mountain ranges, mild and temperate conditions along the coast, wide variations in temperature and humidity in the valleys, and arid conditions and great temperature fluctuations in the desert. The geologic forces that shaped the state's terrain and dictated patterns of climate also created spots of extraordinary beauty, like the geysers of Sonoma County and the grandeur 
of Yosemite. The Spaniards, of course, were hardly the first to discover this land of wonder and extremes. The earliest Californians were adventurous Asians who made their way across the Bering Straits to Alaska thousands of years ago when a warmer climate and a now vanished land bridge made travel much easier. These men and women and their descendants settled North and South America, spreading out to form the various nations and tribes whom the first European visitors to this hemisphere dubbed Indians. The mountain ranges of the Pacific coast isolated these settlers from the cultures that developed in neighboring Mexico and the western United States. Thus, the early population of California bore little physical resemblance to the Native Americans of the Great Plains and apparently shared no ties of language or culture with these nations. California's rugged topography, marked by mountain ranges and deserts, made it difficult for her indigenous groups to travel great distances, and the region's native peoples were even isolated from each other, tending to live in large family groups or clans with little political structure, unlike the larger and nations to the east. As European settlement came late to California, her natives were also denied access to the newcomers' horses, whose runaways fathered the wild herds that gave the Great Plains tribes new mobility as early as the 16th century. Thus divided and isolated, the original Californians were a diverse population separated by language into as many as 135 distinct dialects. On the other hand, the mountains that divided the groups made extensive warfare impractical, and the California tribes and clans enjoyed a comparatively peaceful life. The region's lack of rain during the growing season meant that agriculture was not a practical means of livelihood for early pre-contact Californians. But the gentle climate and rich soil enabled these groups to live by skillfully harvesting and processing wild nuts and berries, and by capturing the fish that crowded the streams. The acorn, leached of toxic acids and turned into meal, was a staple of the diet of most California native people. Indeed, the first English-speaking Europeans to encounter California Native Americans were so struck by their focus on gathering nuts from the ground and unearthing nutritious roots that they nicknamed them diggers or digger Indians, which became a vague nickname for many of the groups. An ample food supply, temperate climate, and absence of wars contributed to a large and healthy population. It has been estimated that when Europeans first came to California, the native population was probably close to about 300,000, or 13% of the indigenous peoples in North America. Europeans' contact with California began in the mid-1530s when Cortez's men ventured to Baja, California. Not until 1542 did Spaniards sail north to Alta California, and Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo's expedition that year made landings as far north as what is modern Santa Barbara. Still, more than 200 years passed before Spain made any concerted effort to colonize the coastal regions Cabrillo had claimed for the crown. Coastal winds and currents made the voyage north difficult, and Spanish captains failed to find safe harbor for their crafts. Baja California became the northwest limit of Spanish colonization, and even there, efforts to settle the area and bring native tribes to Christianity and European ways were half-hearted at best. Not until the Seven Years' War that we had touched on in Chapter 1, if you remember, which ran from 1756 to 1763, realigned European alliances and their colonial empires did Spain seriously attempt to assert control of Alta California. This attempt was made through a combination of military forts called presidios and mission churches overseen by Franciscan friars led by Junipero Serra in 1769. The first party set north from Baja California and the line of Spanish settlement along the coast was inaugurated when soldiers and priests established a presidio and mission church at San Diego. 
By the end of the Spanish colonial period, Alta California had three more presidios at Monterey, San Francisco, and Santa Barbara, and no fewer than 21 missions. In addition to the missions, where San Franciscans ministered to local converts and the military presidios, small towns or pueblos sprang up. The earliest of these were associated with the missions and presidios, but in 1777, an independent civil pueblo was created at San Jose, and then others followed. The pueblos tried to attract settlers with land grants and other inducements, which were governed by an alcalde, which is a combination of a judge and a mayor, assisted by some kind of a council. After 1769, the life of the California natives who came in contact with the Spanish was reshaped by the mission fathers, not the townspeople of the pueblos or the soldiers of the Presidio. The Franciscans came to California not merely to convert the tribes to Christianity, but to train them for a life in European colonial society. Conversion was seldom an entirely voluntary process, and converts, called neophytes, were not left to return to their old ways, but were required to live in the walled mission enclosure or on rancherias, separate settlements sponsored by missions located some distance from the mission proper. There they were taught Spanish, as well as the tenets of their new religion, and trained in skills that would equip them for their new lives. Hard, hard labor, brick making and construction, raising cattle and horses, blacksmithing, as well as weaving, tanning hides, etc. In theory, the neophytes were to live at the missions only until this process of education was complete, and then they would establish homes in the nearby pueblos. As the native people of one region were Christianized and educated, the missionaries were supposed to move on, leaving the old missions behind to become parish churches as they built new missions in more distant locations peopled by non-converted tribes. In fact, neither the Spanish government nor the Franciscans ever judged any of the neophytes ready for secularization or life outside the mission system, and Christian natives, or mission Indians, and their descendants actually remained at the missions until the mission system was abolished in 1834. By that time, 65 years of exposure to Europeans had reduced the number of California's native peoples by about half to 150,000. Although outright warfare cost few lives, Spaniards had introduced not only Christianity, but also new diseases, to which the neophytes, as we know, had no resistance, and thousands died in epidemics. Crowded, harsh living conditions at the missions didn't help. They contributed to the Indians' health problems, and infant mortality and death rates among young children soared. It was the tribes of the coast, the mission Indians, who were most drastically affected. Tribes like the Modocs in the northern mountains had little or no contact with the Spanish and suffered comparatively little. In 1808, Spain's American colonies, one by one, began to fight for independence. Even before this spirit spread to Mexico, California felt the effects of the rebellions, for Spain's hard-pressed navy could not spare ships to bring supplies to the missions, the presidios, and the pueblos north of San Diego. Thus, in the dozen years that followed, local authorities relaxed restrictions on trading with non-Spanish merchants so that the colony could survive, and Californians became accustomed to contact with sailors, traders, hunters, and trappers from England, France, Russia, and of course, the United States. In 1821, Mexico achieved her independence, and word of this event reached Alta California the following year. The colonial policies of the Republic were to be quite different from those of the Spanish monarchy. Not only were Californians allowed now to trade with foreigners, the foreigners could also hold land in the province once they had been naturalized and well converted to Catholicism. Under Spain, land grants to individuals were few in number, and title to these lands remained in the hands of the crown. Under Mexican rule, however, governors were encouraged to make more grants for individual ranchos, and these grants were to be outright. Most important, the new Mexican Republic was determined to move to secularize the missions, 
to remove the natives and the mission property from the control of the Franciscan missionaries, which kind of calls to mind our understanding of Henry VIII and the nationalization of the Roman Church as the Church of England in the 1500s. History just repeats itself, doesn't it, folks? This process began in California in 1834. In theory, the Franciscans had administered the mission lands in trust for the natives living there when the missionaries arrived, but few Native Americans, as you can imagine, benefited from the end of the mission system. Although each family was to receive a small allotment from the former mission lands, the few who tried to make a living from these plots gave up after a few years. Most of the mission's adobe churches and outbuildings soon fell into disrepair, although priests at some missions struggled to continue their ministry to the mission Indians. Most of the mission's lands were disposed of in large grants to white Californians or recently arrived well-connected immigrants from Mexico. In the 10 years before the missions were dismantled, the Mexican government had issued only 50 grants for large ranchos. In the dozen years after the missions were secularized, 600 new grants were made. So a new culture springs up now in California. The legendary life of the ranchero and his family in a society where cattle raising and the marketing of beef and hides became the central factors of economic life. With the end of the missions, most local attempts at manufacturing stopped. The California ranchers, their lands generally close to the Southern California coast, became more and more dependent on the goods brought by foreign merchants who came in search of hides. As British, Canadian, and United States settlers moved to Oregon, there was also an inevitable encroachment of non-Mexicans in Northern California across the border. And more and more trappers and daring mountain men followed their taste for adventure and their search for furs in Northern California and across the Sierras further south. Well, Mexico had always had trouble ruling this distant province. The last governor sent to California from Mexico City came in 1842. His appearance triggered a local revolt, and he withdrew in 1845. Pio Pico, a local ranchero of part African heritage, became governor. Unofficially, California had achieved home rule. A year later, Mexico faced a still greater challenge. By then, California was home to a native population now reduced to less than 100,000 and some 14,000 other permanent residents. Of these, perhaps 2,500 were foreigners, whites of non-Hispanic descent, and of these, probably 2,000 had immigrated from the United States since 1840. The Mexican government and Spanish-speaking Californians became increasingly suspicious of the motives of the Americans of the United States. In 1844, John Charles Fremont led a party of Army topographical engineers that accidentally crossed the Sierras into California and traveled the length of the San Joaquin Valley before making their way home. In 1845, a Commodore in the U.S. Navy, misinformed about relations between his country and Mexico, sailed into Monterey Harbor and declared a victory in, well, a non-existent war. Fremont returned in December of 1845, ostensibly to survey the passes through the Sierras being used by American emigrant train. Thus, Fremont and his 60 armed scouts and soldiers were at hand in the spring of 1846 when rumors circulated of imminent war between Mexico and the United States. Now we come to our beautiful local history, right? On June 10th, Americans near Sonoma took up arms and declared an independent California Republic with a homemade flag bearing a single star and the painted image of a grizzly, thus earning their uprising the name of the Bear Flag Revolt. Fremont joined the rebels in their short-lived republic, which ended on July 9th, when the Americans learned that their nation and Mexico were officially at war and that an American battleship lay in Monterey Harbor. Fremont and his men enlisted in the official military operations and the California Republic ceased to exist. Well, there were many hard-fought battles between Mexican troops and California ranchers on one side and American soldiers and settlers on the other before the Mexican War in California ended in the Americans' favor with the Cahuenga capitulation in January 1847. Before the end of that month, a battalion of Mormons who had enlisted in the army in Iowa arrived. In March, 
They were joined by a thousand members of a regiment from New York who also arrived to fight a war that was over. However, as the Mormons were bound to join Brigham Young and his colony, now located in Utah, New Yorkers, and as most of the New Yorkers had enlisted with the promise that they could remain in California after the war, they were not disappointed necessarily to miss the fighting. They were content to buy their time, acquainting themselves with the newest part of the United States. The territory of Alta California was then home to 150,000 indigenous peoples and 14,000 inhabitants of European and Mexican descent. Most of the surviving native tribes and clans lived in the mountainous north, where the mission fathers had not spread Christianity and European diseases, while most of these 14,000 newcomers lived in the south, clustered around Monterey and Los Angeles. There were Europeans in the north, some living in the tiny training community of Yerba Buena, as we know, rechristened San Francisco, and others clustered around Sutter's Fort on the Sacramento River. All realized that the United States government would bring great changes, but none could have anticipated just how quickly those changes would come. In 1847, all waited restlessly for the fighting to end outside California. The soldiers from New York contented themselves with garrison duty and odd jobs until word came of peace. But the Mormons were discharged in the summer of 1847 and mainly went to work for Johann Sutter. With peace, Sutter could finally proceed with his plans to lay out a town near his fort to attract some of the expected hordes of American settlers who would now stream through the passes of the Sierras. A town would require lumber, and for this Sutter needed a nearby sawmill so that he could reap the profits of every process in creating what he's going to call Sutterville. Just when the Mormons appeared seeking employment, Sutter's partner, James Marshall, found a site for the proposed sawmill, a place called Coloma, about 45 miles from Sutter's Fort, on the South Fork of the American River. Many of the Mormons Sutter hired that summer were assigned to follow Marshall to Coloma, to Coloma where they finished the sawmill in January. Next, they set to work deepening the stream so that the mill race would have adequate power. On January 24, 1848, Marshall went down to the river to inspect progress, and as he later told the story, quote, my eye was caught by something shining at the bottom of the ditch. I reached my hand down and picked it up. It made my heart thump, for I was certain it was gold. And then I saw another, close quote. As word of the discovery of gold spread, Sutter's and Marshall's workmen left their jobs to dig for gold along the American River and its tributaries, and Sutter's fort and fields were soon deserted. Still, large members of prospectors did not arrive until May, when word of the strike and a sample of gold dust were shown in San Francisco. Almost overnight, the port turned into a near ghost town as merchants, sailors, soldiers, and laborers rushed inland to the gold fields. It was not long before the gold seekers from all over the state, Hispanic Californians, Native Americans and Europeans and U.S. citizens joined them. As word spread outside California in the following months, the new national and ethnic groups contributed their share to this fascinating mix of the gold fields. Mormons from Utah, farmers and trappers from nearby Oregon, experienced miners from Mexico and Chile, white sailors and merchants and native workers from Hawaii, and Chinese from the province of Kwantung near Canton. It was no accident that few of the immigrant 48ers came from the United States. Well, without telegraph lines or a railroad, news of the gold strike at Coloma had to travel to the Atlantic coast by ships that sailed around the Pacific coast, then around the Horn of South Africa, or across the Isthmus of Panama, to await another ship in the Caribbean, a journey that can consume six or seven months. On the other hand, the 7,000 mile journey by sea to China took only three months. <laughs> Not only did news of the gold strike take longer to reach the eastern United States, but in 1848, it came in tentative, unconfirmed stories that tempted few to chance the long, difficult journey to California. Well, thanks to a young army officer named William Tecumseh Sherman, that situation would soon change. At the end of June 1848, Sherman persuaded his commander, California's military governor, Colonel Richard Barnes Mason, to
to visit the gold fields himself to verify the tales of wealth along the American River. Governor Mason's report of that trip prompted President Polk to make an official announcement of the gold strike in his State of the Union message to Congress in December of 1848. This official confirmation of the news triggered a mass exodus to California, and the 49ers were on their way. It was August of 1848 before the United States Senate ratified the treaty ending the Mexican War and recognizing the transfer of California to the American hands. Local army commanders, 48ers, and Hispanic rancheros all waited anxiously for details of the form of territorial government that California would enjoy. When no news arrived, local residents well took matters into their own hands, with mass meetings as early as December of 1848 debating California's political future. As tens of thousands of 49ers joined the rush, the need became more pressing. Congress and the President did nothing, and in September of 1849, 48 delegates met in Monterey to draw up a state constitution. The document was closely modeled on the constitutions of Iowa and New York, the home states of many members of the convention, and it made California a free state from which slavery would be excluded. The frame of government was ratified by popular vote on November 13th, and state officials were chosen that same day. While Eastern congressmen and representatives argued over whether and how to admit this new free state, California has gone on with the business of finding gold and making money. In the mining camps, the miners themselves were responsible for local affairs. In only a few years, they worked out rules governing the discovery and exploitation of mineral resources that were later incorporated into state and federal statutes. As for criminal law, miners and local townspeople were equally efficient in dealing out their own form of justice. As towns sprang up near the camps, newly appointed officials were appointed to impose order. Meanwhile, back east, established forces of morality and order, like the major Protestant churches, were concerned about the society to which the states of the Atlantic seaboard and the Midwest were sending their young men and women. Sensing that California might be in desperate need of moral guidance, home mission boards of these churches sent clergymen west to minister to the souls of miners, saloon keepers, peddlers, and merchants in California's booming towns and cities and the isolated mining camps. Finally, on September 9, 1850, President Fillmore signed the bill that gave California statehood. However, state government didn't automatically bring law and order to California. In San Francisco, local citizens became so impatient with the inability or unwillingness of local officials to enforce the law that they formed a vigilance committee in 1851. By the time that the committee disbanded at the end of September, they had hanged four men, handed 15 over to the police for trials, and whipped or deported 29 more. The San Francisco experience inspired vigilance committees in other towns and mining camps. The apparent reforms brought by the 1851 San Francisco vigilantes were short-lived and when the city's marshals and one of its newspaper editors were shot down in 1856, the second San Francisco Vigilance Committee was formed, this time even seizing arms from the local state militia. The first federal consensus conducted in California in 1860 counted 308,000 folks. Population had almost tripled since 1847. While gold mining was still an important factor in the state economy, Californians were finding other ways to earn a living. By the mid-1850s, the state farms had made California self-sufficient just in raising wheat. Cattle ranching flourished, and by 1860, local ranches produced four times as many cows as they had in 1848. Still, everyone in the booming state was painfully aware of the difficulties of bringing goods in and sending them out. There was no rail link to the eastern United States. There were other, more ominous signs of the transition from the gold rush boom to the problems of a permanent society. Even in the 1850s, as the limits of gold bonanza for single independent miners became apparent, white American miners were resentful of the other national groups represented in the camps. While they usually accepted non-English-speaking Europeans, they had less tolerance for Latin American miners 
and none at all for the Chinese. In 1850, the new California legislature adopted a foreign miners license law charging all non-U.S. citizens $20 a month. This fee proved unreasonably high, and the law was repealed the next year. But before the law was repealed, many Chinese left the mining camps, moving to San Francisco, where they soon established themselves in the city's business community and created America's first Chinatown. But many more came to the mountain of gold. The height of California gold rush immigration came in 1852. Of the 67,000 people who came to California that year, 20,000 were from China. Chinese miners who continued their search for gold found increasingly harsh treatment at the hands of their fellow miners. The legislature adopted a new foreign miners tax of $4 a month, and anti-Chinese feeling surfaced in many mining camps. Well, at last the railroads came, and the end of California's physical isolation from the rest of the United States not only changed the economy, but altered anti-Chinese attitudes. Debate on the route of the Transcontinental Railroad was unable to overcome disagreement over whether the railway should follow a northern or a southern path until coming of the Civil War in 1861. With the slave states part of the Confederacy, this sectional stumbling block vanished. Indeed, the construction of the railroad may have been the most important immediate effect of that war on California. Although a California battalion served in Virginia and other California troops were sent to New Mexico, most volunteers who enlisted never left the state and spent their military service guarding federal institutions. California wheat and wool from California sheep did their part for the Union effort as well. The railroads that the Chinese built, however, contributed to a situation in which racial bias became still more ugly. As railroads spread throughout the state, California's economy and population patterns quickly changed. Easy access to rail lines made citrus growing and other large-scale agricultural pursuits an important element in the state economy. Farming in California never resembled the model seen in the Midwest or even in the Plains, where homesteaders could acquire cheap government land for family farms. Once it became clear that the United States would control California in 1846, the Mexican governor, Pio Pico, hurriedly signed 800 land grants, giving them fraudulent dates so that they would appear to precede the American takeover. Even earlier land grants tended to be vague and contradictory in wording, no matter what other claims they had to validity, and this meant that much of the best land for farming and ranching lay with old grants that were to be challenged in the courts over decades. Only the well-to-do could afford to spend this time and money, and would-be small farmers usually had to content themselves with being squatters or giving up their dreams. This pattern was strengthened with the coming of the major rail lines. Much of the remaining public land went to the railroads as subsidies for constructing their lines. Farming in California was therefore always commercial farming. The patterns of land ownership reinforced by the need to invest substantial money in irrigation and reclamation. Irrigation, in turn, did not become feasible during the boom of canals and stream diversion for mining. Thus, it wasn't until the 1860s that large-scale irrigated farming became common. When major rail construction ended in the early 1870s, Chinese laborers moved easily into agriculture. Proving themselves skilled farm workers and enterprising operators, of small garden farms of their own. The expansion of irrigation canals in Southern California also drew the Chinese to these farms, making this group of immigrants a statewide phenomenon. Accordingly, hostility to the Chinese spread from the northern mining camps to the farming regions and factory sites throughout the state. Anti-Chinese sentiment was exacerbated by the fact that the Transcontinental Railroad had ended California's comparative isolation from economic cycles in the rest of the United States. A natural depression in the mid-1870s struck California, where labor leaders like Dennis Kearney fired anti-Chinese feeling. In 1882, Congress passed the first Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred further Chinese immigration for 10 years. So, this summary of events in California 
in the last half of the 19th century really doesn't pretend to be a complete survey of the state's history in this period. Instead, it attempts to provide a basis for understanding the major themes of the political landscape we find ourselves in today as we progress into our examination of California state and local government. So understanding where California came to be then in its political evolution, we hearken back then to our chapters two and three conversations about federalism and states' rights vis-a-vis -vis the national government. In California especially, a big difference between the national and the state manifestations of government is the progressive era reforms. We'll touch on that in a second. The jumping off place, though, is the chapter two and three conversation on federalism. My friends, you remember that our founders realized the best way to form a long and lasting union was to give the power of self-governance and determination to the states, right? This goes back to Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau and Montesquieu. The federal government is paramount only with regard to its enumerated powers as set forth in the Constitution and as legislated by Congress within that authority. Our individual states and territories have the commonality of federal association with the uniqueness of separate and distinct state identifications. The United States of America is made up of different and unique states. This is our great strength. What is good for California isn't necessarily good for Kentucky and vice versa. The ability for states to run their own affairs, including their economies, health care, education, social services, businesses, etc., at the state and local levels, make them more accountable to the people they serve. Those who govern closely govern best, it is said. Well, along with Teddy Roosevelt, one of my pantheon of heroes in American political history is Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis. He was the first to popularize this phrase that states are laboratories of democracy. Louis Brandeis, in his dissent in the 1932 case, New State Ice Company versus Liebman, stated that, quote, a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country, close quote. In a wonderful book that I'm going to draw liberally from, Democracy in California, Politics and Government in the Golden State by Brian Janiski and Ken Masugi, we understand the great national reform movement, known as progressivism, sought to replace fundamental American political practices, such as limited government of separated powers, with the unlimited government closer to the parliamentary model. It drew its principles from Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his German followers, such as George Hegel, who make the will of the people the source of all legitimate rule. Because the will of the people cannot contradict itself, it cannot be limited, and hence powers should not be separated as they are in American democracy. This is not simply a spontaneous outburst, but it is self-knowing and self-actualizing. Its discipline is found in the administrative state, popularly known as the bureaucracy. The core of this European philosophy found its way into the beliefs of prominent American progressives, such as the prolific John Dewey, who lived from 1859 to 1952. For such Americans as Dewey, progressivism stood for a scientific attitude toward politics, which explicitly rejected the natural rights basis of American politics as expressed in the Declaration of Independence. This meant that there were no inherent limits on legitimate government, as in the principle of just government requiring the concerns of the governed. The progressives were particularly critical of property rights-based arguments that corporate America was fond of using. 
So government regulation in the name of the public interest followed logically. Early progressives also despised the machine politics of that era. The political machine, the spoils system, and the vibrancy of American politics received an immortal defense in the classic Plunkett of Tammany Hall, in which George Washington Plunkett protested that the reform movement was undermining the manhood of the nation and making the Declaration of Independence a farce. The administrative state, staffed by experts from the universities, would take on the challenge of an industrializing society now being filled with new waves of immigrants. Progressivist politics was closely aligned with the developing academic programs in the universities, especially the new discipline of political science. Evolutionary science, such as the important work of Charles Darwin, allegedly swept away the claims of self-evident truth of the founding generation, which rested on the notion of a knowledgeable and enduring human nature. The will of the new political academic elite sought to satisfy the people's security and needs. Perhaps progressivism's clearest sign of the reliance on an enlightened electorate are the initiative referendum, and recall. These are means by which the electorate can directly vote in new laws, or as in the case of California that we're going to see, actually easily amend the state constitution. In California, as well as in other states, progressivism aimed at transforming both Democratic and Republican parties into its image of a reformed politic, one free of bosses and partisanship. For example, the Big Four's railroad dominated the economy of the state and whatever laws and judges were needed to maintain its grip. Regulation of powerful industries such as the railroad, although in principle this applied to any economic entity, was also deemed necessary to support the public interest. Progressivism was not a labor or agriculture party as sprouted up in other regions of the country. I'm thinking of the Grange. It was more a part of middle-class respectability, born in the Midwest and with roots in New England religion. Though many progressive politicians were lawyers and journalists, many others were reform-minded businessmen who were labeled goo-goos, remember those, for their good government enthusiasms. Perhaps a character in Frank Norris's novel, The Octopus, best expresses the frustrations of the reformers. Quote, California likes to be fooled. Indifference to public affairs, absolute indifferent. It stamps us all. Our state is a very paradise of fools. Close quote. Which brings us to how progressivism developed and was manifested in California as part of our laboratory of democracy, a la Louis Brandeis. Hiram Johnson lived from 1866 to 1945 and was a leading American progressive Republican politician from California. He served as our governor from 1911 to 1917, and then as our senator in Washington from 1917 to his death in 1945. He was also Teddy Roosevelt's running mate in the 1912 progressive ticket where Teddy challenged William Howard Taft, but by virtue of the Republican Party not allowing Teddy to run on the Republican ticket, Teddy and Hiram Johnson created their own progressive party, also known as the Bull Moose Party. When this same Hiram Johnson and his progressive brethren seized control of the government of California in 1910, they produced one of the most enduring legacies in the state's political history as a laboratory of democracy. As Jackson Putnam suggests in the pattern of modern California politics, Hiram Johnson determined to strengthen the power of the people and to weaken or destroy the power of interests and fashioned a political system and a political style that prevailed for more than half a century and really only recently started to cease to exist. To describe the major features of this progressive order and of the system that seems largely to have replaced it is the purpose of this part of this lecture. Suffice it to say 
that the progressives' chosen devices to strengthen the people vis-a-vis -vis the parties, such as direct primaries, direct legislation, including the initiative and the referendum, recall of office holders, women's suffrage, presidential primaries, and the direct election of U.S. senators not only quickly made their way into statute books and the state constitution, but became partial models for other states and the federal government to copy as well. It is noteworthy, however, that the California progressives' techniques to weaken the interests of party have remained much more peculiarly Californian. Aside from corporate and especially public utility regulation, which was adopted by many states, California's reformers' other initiatives remain unique. More than other reformers, they have zeroed in on the political party as their main object of wrath and deliberately chose to disable it and simultaneously the insidious corporate interests which presumably controlled it. Nonpartisanship, thus, became a code for political virtue in California, and serious efforts were made to institutionalize it. The techniques chosen were various. Mandatory, nonpartisan, judicial and local government elections, the creation of a large, unwieldy, and powerless party structure denied the right to endorse candidates, and the notorious cross-filing system whereby candidates could run on any and all party ballots, these strange devices not only contributed to California's reputation for embracing the bizarre, but they also produced consequences often the opposite of the intentions of their progressive framers. Instead of weakening the malign special interests, the assault upon the political party in California actually strengthened them. California office holders, especially governors and legislators, now deprived of all effective support and direction by political parties, became primarily dependent on lobbyists from interest groups for funding and other forms of political support. The legislature, in the view of one acute observer, became a vast commodity market in which lobbyists pressured legislators to pass legislation favoring their clients and to block or weaken those which threaten them. The system reached its alleged height of infamy in the 1930s and the 1940s when super lobbyist Arthur Samish supposedly worked his will with the state lawmakers and became his own self-styled governor of the legislature. Despite its notoriety, this nonpartisan political system, a California progressive laboratory of democracy element had a number of positive payoffs. For one thing, paradoxically, it was relatively non-corrupt. This statement seems to contradict the admissions of Samish himself, whose candid revelations of legislators on the take once made juicy reading for the general public. Still, most legislators' greed seemingly was for innocuous freebies food and booze and travel, and money for remarkably inexpensive political campaigns rather than for the wholesale raids on the state treasury. Consequently, California politics remain largely free of incidents of large-scale bribery that characterize the systems of machine politics in other states where the political party remained a powerful institution. Furthermore, there was little need for lobby-dominated legislators to engage in political corruption since their main function was to pass laws legalizing the practices of their constituents. Lobbyists saw little need to corrupt an institution that they already controlled. A more important payoff was the fact that the new nonpartisan style legislator and governor had to truly govern, and many of them got quite good at it. The California office holder had to confront directly the conflicting demands of his constituents and the necessities of his time. This required an ability to devise policies according to practical realities and to judge their effectiveness by actual results. 
Politicians soon learned that knowledge of complex social realities came only from systematic study and fact-gathering, and that such realities were always more complicated than partisan preconceptions about them. They thus, acquiring political sophistication from sustained experience in dealing with complex problems, and it often appeared that this trial and error was the most reliable method of social problem solving. In short, pragmatism replaced ideology in the California political arena, and this was probably the most significant consequence of the rise of progressivism and of nonpartisanship. A close second in importance was the replacement of political extremism with political moderation. This condition came about because the various interests which presumably dominated the lives of office holders were themselves extraordinarily diverse and divided. Furthermore, from the point of view of the enlightened citizen, there were many good lobbyists well, as well as bad ones. Not only business group and labor leaders sought access to office holders, but so did school teachers and social reformers, welfare recipients, old age pensioners, environmentalists ethnic representatives, and a host of other pluralistic ideas. In the midst of such a welter of conflicting aspirations, both legislators and governors had to become adept not only in reading social realities and designing appropriate political programs, but also at reconciling opposing interests, in other words, cutting deals, and resolving conflicts by compromise, which is at the heart of pluralism. Programs which were products of negotiation replace those conforming precisely to preconceived ideological principles drawn up in party caucuses. As products of compromise, such half-a-loaf programs were bound to be moderate, and though horrifying to all-or-nothing doctrinaires, they served public needs and became the standard product of progressive politicians in California. The third major consequence of the nonpartisan progressive style was the replacement of political laissez-faire with sustained political activism. Constantly confronted by representatives of interest groups, making tangible demands, and living in times of extraordinary expansion, emergency, and growth, California politicians from the 1910s to the 1960s placed little credence in a philosophy of government which counseled minimal activity and governing best by governing least. Their constituents demanded that they perform rather than shirk, dawdle, or obstruct, and the successful California political leader was the one who learned to devise acceptable political programs to serve perceived social needs. Action became the name of the game in modern California politics. This progressive emphasis on pragmatism, moderation, and activism did not, of course, come into being all at once. In fact, in the beginning, Hiram Johnson and his zealous disciples seemed every bit as ideological and partisan as those they had driven from office. By the end of his administration, however, this shift to what might be called neo-progressivism had largely taken place, and it was particularly exemplified in the administration of Hiram Johnson's successor, William D. Stevenson, who served as governor from 1917 to 1922. Although spurned by Johnson and scorned by some historians as a reactionary, largely because of his actions on race, labor, and prohibition issues, Stevenson nevertheless embodied the neo-progressive approach in a number of ways. His activism was revealed in his successful demands for the expansion of state services of all kinds, the creation of new agencies to administer those services, a substantial tax increase to finance them, and an expanded state budget passed over the strenuous objections of the conservative wing of his own party. Stevenson's neo-progressive pragmatism was reflected in two major ways. One was his practice of making policy decisions not on the basis of ideology, but instead basing them on findings of special government commissions chosen to make detailed studies, scientific studies, of specific problems. This goes to the heart of progressivism and neo-progressivism. The other was his innovative policy of government reorganization, whereby he consolidated most state agencies into a streamlined departmental system modeled on the modern business corporation 
and defined by his own gubernatorial role as the head of this reorganized government as the business manager of the state. Finally, Stevens demonstrated his moderation by hammering out all of the new policies in give-and-take consultation with the legislature and citizen groups. And in his vetoes of legislation, of which he philosophically approved, but which he thought the state could not afford. So again, looking at the California Constitution, how is progressivism exemplified? What are the main differences between the national government and California's government? And what do you account for those differences? That's our seminar question, right? Well, I would argue that the main differences would be the impact of direct democracy, or even quasi, somewhat direct democracy. And these are exemplified through three mechanisms that are extant in the California Constitution, by which voters can have the final say on a matter of policy. These are called initiative, referenda, and recall attempts, all of which can be placed on either a primary or a general election ballot. Whether or not a measure is placed on a primary or general election ballot, it's decided within that single election. Initiatives are employed in 21 states, and there is no primary for competing initiatives. Referenda are employed in all states except Alabama, and recall elections are available to residents of 16 states. So, the initiative. Initiatives get their name because they are policy proposals that are initiated by individuals or groups and not by the state legislature. There are two types of initiatives, statute and constitutional. Voters decide whether a statute initiative may become part of the California Code, i.e. California law, and whether a constitutional initiative may become part of the California Constitution. In order to place a statute initiative on the ballot, supporters must collect petition signatures equivalent to or greater than 5% of the total votes cast in the most recent gubernatorial election, or the election for the office of governor. The signature requirement for a constitutional initiative is 8%. If either initiative is placed on the ballot, it needs a simple majority vote to be approved. For the referendum, on a referendum proposal, voters are asked to judge an action previously taken by the state legislature. There are three main types of referenda, statute, constitutional, and mandatory. A statute referendum is proposed when an individual or group wishes to remove an element from the California Code that was enacted by the legislature. The qualifying procedure is identical to that of the statute initiative, and if a majority of the voters approve the referendum, the statute is removed from the California Code. So this is kind of the people's veto. The remaining two types of referenda are placed on the ballot by the legislature. A constitutional referendum is placed on the ballot by a two-thirds vote of each chamber, 27 in the Senate, 54 in the Assembly, with each chamber voting separately. If a majority of voters approve the measure, it becomes a part of the California Constitution. A mandatory referendum is also placed on the ballot after a two-thirds vote from each chamber. Mandatory referenda, in that they're required by the Constitution, involve the approval of government bonds, which are used to fund large construction projects and other significant capital outlays. These referenda, again, are called mandatory because the legislature and the governor cannot issue bonds that are backed by taxpayer dollars unless the measure is approved by the taxpayers, the voters. However, urgency measures are exempt from the referendum process. Finally, the recall. So state and local officers can actually be removed before the expiration of their term by means of a recall petition and election. In order for a recall election to take place, supporters must obtain a minimum number of signatures, and the amount required to force an election varies with the office. For directly elected executives, what we call the constitutional officers, 
except for the four district representatives on the State Board of Equalization, the number of signatures must be at least 12% of the total votes cast in the most recent election for that office, with the further stipulation that the signatures must be collected from at least five counties. For state legislators, members of the Board of Equalization, and appellate court judges, the signatures must be equal to at least 20% of the total votes cast in the last election of that office. For local officials, the number of signatures required varies with the size of the locality. If enough signatures are collected, two separate questions are placed on the ballot. The first is whether or not the office holder should be recalled. The second asks for a replacement office holder should a majority of those voting choose to recall the sitting office holder. If a majority decides to recall the officer, the person receiving the most votes on the second question takes office. Recall elections are rare and are more common for local officials than for state officials. However, such actions need not be frequent to be memorable and their impact can be profound and last for decades. The memory of just one election, removing a colleague, can lead a legislator to abandon any notions of drifting too far from the sentiments of their constituents. So some memorable initiatives, just to place this in context, you know, Californians face a barrage of proposals in the form of initiatives of referenda, and a typical ballot contains a dozen or so proposals. Very often, the initiative or referendum process is used by the governors, legislators, and interest groups to obtain desired policy goals after failing to enact them in the normal legislative process. In fact, huge commercial enterprises developed around direct democracy in California. Petition gathering, polling, legal counseling, and campaign consulting amount to a major industry in the Golden State. The situation is so complex that sometimes a group opposed to a policy, successfully places an initiative on the ballot, hoping for it to be defeated. Even though the system is complex, direct democracy remains very popular with the people of the state of California. Some of the most memorable initiatives that have passed concern property tax relief, Proposition 13, term limit, which was Proposition 140 in 1990, one touching on illegal immigration in 1994, the scaling back of affirmative action in 1996, the scaling back of bilingual education in 1998, approving casino gambling in 1998, increasing tobacco taxes, protection of marriage, etc. Unless the initiative is drafted otherwise, most are required to go into effect immediately upon passage, unless, of course, the proposal is struck down in the courts. So, even if the voters approve an initiative, it may still be invalidated in a federal or state court, such as Proposition 8. Most of the time, it is the federal courts that act to strike down California initiatives. One reason for this could be the fact that state judges must stand for voter approval, while federal judges have lifetime appointments and thus have less to lose by making unpopular decisions. Which brings us finally to our examination of our three branches of government in California, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. California's legislature illustrates many of the challenges facing California politics. Increasingly, the legislature also represents the diversity of the Golden State. Once dominated by rural interests, as I suggested in our introduction, and the Southern Pacific Railroad, its powers were tightly drawn by the progressives in the early 1900s. After decades of stagnation, the legislature finally became more professional in the 1960s and through reapportionment, more reflective of the state's urban growth. Since the 1970s, the legislature has gradually become more partisan and on occasion then, likewise, more deadlocked, reflecting the state's growing diversity of interests. Furthermore, the passage of term limits, which was Proposition 140 in 1990, raised serious questions about the long-term policy role of a once envied institution. The California legislature performs a variety of functions, policy making, representation, executive oversight, and civic education. 
Most legislators attain office through a combination of personal initiative and sponsorship by legislative and party leaders. Until Proposition 140 and term limits, the legislature offered attractive political careers to its members. It still offers opportunities for advancement from one house to another, to statewide offices, and to Congress, and to influential lobbying positions. In doing its business, the legislature relies heavily on a handful of leaders, the most powerful being the Speaker of the Assembly. A combination of committees and leadership posts structure the legislative process that we're going to touch on, one that seems simple on paper, but which actually boils with internal politics. Lobbyists provide essential information to members and committees while representing a diversity of interests in California, as we touched on in Chapter 7. Nowadays, the California legislature faces a variety of challenges. The growing number of conflicting interests, social change, economic turmoil, and a restive public dissatisfied with the legislature's performance. The California legislature is bicameral, like the United States Congress and 49 of the 50 state legislatures. This means that the legislature is divided into two decision-making bodies, a 40-member Senate and an 80-member Assembly. Bicameralism serves a vital function in a republic, and de Tocqueville described it as a necessity of the first order. Modern political science scholarship confirms the ancient understanding that bicameralism reduces the potential instability of Republican governments. People have little respect for an institution that makes frantic or illogical decisions, which are more possible under unicameral governments. Under bicameralism, it is more difficult for a single group to control the entire process, which ensures a more stable policy system that is more likely to produce a reverence for the rule of law, a necessary condition for political life. California senators are elected to four-year terms, and the California Assembly members are elected to two-year terms. Furthermore, as a result of Prop 140, as mentioned earlier, members of the Senate are limited to two four-year terms, and members of the Assembly are limited to three two-year terms. As in other states, debates continue over the wisdom of term limits, which, in California's case, are among the nation's most restrictive. By increasing the turnover of legislative members, one does not increase the power of government, other members of the executive branch, career government staff, or interest groups. Is California's government better served by virtue of term limits? Well, the answer remains to be seen, as term limits are still relatively new in California. Like the United States Congress, the California legislature is not a continuous body and no two legislatures are exactly alike. Some members lose elections, retire, or die in office. At the beginning of each two-year legislature, the members of each chamber organize themselves into a majority caucus, which contains those members from the chamber's majority party, and a minority caucus, which contains those members from the chamber's minority party. Insofar as leadership, we begin with the Speaker of the Assembly. The presiding officers of the Assembly are the Speaker of the Assembly, the Majority Leader, and the Minority Leader. The Majority and Minority Leaders are elected by their own party caucuses, and the entire chamber elects the Speaker. Like the Speaker of the U.S. House, the Speaker of the Assembly will be a member of the Majority Party. After a series of straw polls, the majority caucus unites behind one candidate. One historic exception to this rule occurred after the 1994 elections. The Republicans had won a narrow victory over the Democrats and took control of the Assembly. However, Republican Assemblyman Paul Horcher defected to the Democratic side, leaving longtime GOP nemesis Willie Brown, a Democrat, as the Speaker. Horcher was eventually recalled and the Republicans regained control of the chamber. However, Doris Allen, another Republican defector, switched sides and titled effective control of the chamber to the Democrats until she too was recalled by her constituents. The Speaker has effective control 
over who will sit on committees, the assignment of particular bills to committees, who will be recognized on the floor of the chamber, and the amount of financial support members of the majority caucus will receive in the next re-election bid. The titular head of the Senate is the lieutenant governor, which mirrors the dual role of the vice president of the United States as president of the Senate. Like the vice president, the lieutenant governor rarely becomes involved in legislative affairs. The lieutenant governor's only major legislative responsibility, as with the vice president, is to cast a deciding vote in the case of a tie. The effective head of the Senate is the president pro tem. The most influential member of the majority caucus is usually elected president pro tem. He or she chairs the Senate Rules Committee, which acts as the main governing body of the chamber and supervises such duties as assigning committee seats and monitoring the flow of bills. While not approaching the same relative level of power as the Speaker, the President Pro Tem has become a more pivotal figure in the legislative process in recent years. Looking at the legislative process by which bills can become laws, we see that there are five stages. Introducing a bill, committee consideration, floor consideration, consideration in the other chamber, and then consideration by the governor. Only sitting legislators can introduce legislation in the assembly or the senate. The governor, lieutenant governor, or other government officials not in the legislature, nor private citizens, can introduce legislation into either the assembly or the senate. However, it is common for them to work closely with legislators in drafting legislation. So, a legislator who thinks a policy proposal would make good law drafts the idea into a formal document known as a bill. Generally speaking, a legislator will propose the broad outline of such a bill and leave it to the staff members to fill in the details. Once the bill is drafted, it is then officially introduced into the chamber. The clerk of the chamber assigns it a number according to the order in which it was introduced. If the bill was introduced into the Senate, then the letters SB, meaning Senate bill, will appear before the number, and AB appears before the number on assembly bills. It's important to remember that a bill must pass in the same two-year legislature in which it was introduced. If a legislature expires before the bill is enacted into law, the bill must start over again when the legislature convenes. The next step after introduction is committee consideration. The rules committee in each chamber assigns a bill to a committee according to the bill's subject matter. For example, an assembly farm bill would likely be assigned to that chamber's agriculture committee. A senate farm bill would go to the senate's agriculture and water resources committee. It is the job of the committee to study the bill and decide whether or not it should be considered by the full chamber. Committees are often key institutions in each chamber. They hold hearings, conduct studies, assess the likelihood that a bill will have a reasonable chance of passage on a floor vote. They hold hearings, conduct studies, and assess the likelihood that a bill will have a reasonable chance of passage on a floor vote. Member and committee staffs analyze the legislation, and lobbyists make their views known. In addition, a nonpartisan legislative analyst, who is appointed by the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, provides members with budgetary, fiscal, and policy information. Committees act as filters through which thousands of bills must pass. Because it's physically impossible for the legislature to vote on every bill introduced in each chamber, most bills are not approved by committees for floor consideration. So, if a bill survives this committee process as described, it's brought to the floor for full consideration by the chamber. A majority vote of the entire membership is required for the bill to survive, 21 in the Senate and 41 in the Assembly. If the bill receives a majority vote, it's sent to the other chamber where it's reintroduced. If the bill is approved by a majority vote in the other chamber, without amending the version sent to it by the original chamber, it is enrolled as an act of legislation and sent to the governor.
The original chamber must agree to these changes or a conference committee will need to be convened. In a conference committee, three members from each chamber meet in order to produce a single identical bill that could be sent to each chamber. If no compromise can be reached, the bill dies. If a compromise is reached and each chamber approves an identical bill, then it's sent to the governor. When receiving a bill, the governor has four options. Sign the act within 12 days, which would make it a law. Do nothing for 12 days and allow the act to become law without signature. Veto the act, which means that the act would only become law if the legislature voting separately in each chamber supported it with a two-thirds vote, or invoke what is commonly referred to as a pocket veto. An opportunity to exercise a pocket veto only happens at the end of the two-year legislature. If the legislature is set to expire and adjourns permanently within the 12-day consideration period, the governor can simply ignore the act and it will die without any further consideration. If an act becomes a law, it will go into effect on the following January 1st, as long as 90 days have expired since it was approved. Exceptions to this rule are known as urgency measures, which, if approved by the governor, go into immediate effect. However, a two-thirds vote is required of each chamber in order to send an urgency measure to the governor. Other legislation requiring this two-thirds or a supermajority approval are budget bills, constitutional amendments, and Senate impeachment trials. The two-thirds requirement for a budget bill has a profound effect on California politics because it's rare indeed for a majority party to have two-thirds control of either chamber. Therefore, the minority caucus is intricately involved in the engineering of the state's budget to agree that is almost unheard of in other states or even in the U.S. Congress. The California legislature really is one of the most professional state legislatures in the United States. Looking at the committees, going through this list just very quickly gives us an idea of the scope and breadth of the issues that the state legislature must take. Juxtaposing this to that at the national level, we see that these issues touch more closely the day-to-day -day lives of Californians. The California legislature is one of the most professional state legislatures in the United States. Like the United States Congress and 49 of the 50 other state legislatures, as I mentioned, it is bicameral. Again, it is divided into a 40-member Senate and an 80-member assembly. Redistricting plans are proposed every 10 years following the national census and are often surrounded by partisan controversy. California Senate members are elected to four-year terms and are limited to two terms. California Assembly members are elected to two-year terms and are limited to three terms. The presiding assembly officer is the speaker and the effective presiding Senate officer is the president pro tem. The legislative process has five stages, introducing a bill, committee consideration, floor consideration, consideration in the other chamber, and consideration by the governor. The governor, lieutenant governor, other government officials not in the legislature, and private citizens cannot introduce legislation into either the Assembly or the Senate. The Rules Committee assigns a bill to committee according to the bill's subject matter. If a bill survives the committee process, it is brought to the floor for full consideration by the chamber. If an identical bill is not approved by the other chamber, the bill dies. If the other chamber approves the bill, the governor can sign it, allow it to become law without a signature, veto it, or employ as I mentioned, the pocket veto. Which brings us to the executive branch. The executive branch of the state of California is entrusted with the implementation of laws that have been passed by California or that have been mandated by the federal government. As at the national level, the term executive is derived from the Latin 
Isakor, which means to carry out. California's executive branch is more fragmented than the executive branch of the federal government, whereas the President of the United States is the sole elected head of the federal executive branch. The leadership of California's executive branch is divided among a number of what we call constitutional officers. This shared responsibility is known as a plural executive, which is another of the main differences between California's government and that at the national level. Important to remember for your seminar question response. Furthermore, the California governor's powers over the executive branch are limited by California's civil service system, which has been in place since the progressive reforms of 1913. A strong civil service system is a key element in the form of administration called bureaucracy. California's executive branch is one of the most bureaucratic in the nation, if not the world, and its level of bureaucratization is a result of the rise of progressivism since the late 19th century. The governor is the commander-in-chief of this state's militia. The governor is the official communicator among the state's government, the federal government, and other states of the United States. The governor supervises the official conduct of all executive and ministerial offices, and the governor sees that all offices are filled and their duties performed. The governor's appointment power extends over significant areas of state government. First, the governor has the authority to fill vacancies in the judiciary, i.e. the municipal, superior, appeals, and supreme courts, and to fill newly created judgeships. Second, the governor has the power, subject to confirmation by the state senate, to appoint a large number of positions throughout the executive department. The governor communicates during each calendar year with the legislature regarding the condition of the state and makes recommendations. The governor submits an itemized budget to the legislature within the first 10 days of each year. The governor may veto any bill passed by the legislature and return it with his objections to the House of Origin. The governor may also reduce or eliminate one or more items of appropriation while approving other portions of a bill. This is called the line item veto. One key difference between the expression of governance in California and that at the federal level is that while the governor, like the president, may veto any bill passed by the legislature and return it with their objections to the house of origin, the governor may also reduce or eliminate one or more items of appropriation in a bill while approving other portions of the bill. This is called the line item veto. The president had it for a very short period, about six months before the national Supreme Court struck it down as unconstitutional. The California governor, however, maintains possession of the line item veto, being able to line out one part of a bill, but pass the other. The governor utilizes, in addition to immediate staff, a cabinet that is composed of 10 major state agencies, business, transportation and housing, corrections, rehabilitation, environmental protection, food and agriculture, health and human services, labor and workforce development, resources, state, state and consumer services, veterans affairs, as well as the director of finance and the secretary of education. So this group serves as the governor's chief policy advisory body and in their individual capacities, each implement and coordinate the governor's policies throughout the state. The cabinet supplies the governor with a comprehensive view and a current resume of the state's operations and serves as a source for long-range planning. For example, the lieutenant governor. The Constitution provides that the lieutenant governor shall become governor in the event of a vacancy. 
except for recall, as mentioned earlier. The lieutenant governor shall serve as acting governor in the event of the governor's absence from the state, their temporary disability, or impeachment. The Constitution also provides that the lieutenant governor shall be president of the Senate, but they shall have only a casting vote, a tiebreaker. The purpose of the casting vote may be used only if it will provide the necessary majority required. The lieutenant governor serves as an ex officio capacity as a voting member of the University of California's Board of Regents and as a voting member of the California State University's Board of Trustees. They serve and rotates with the state controller as chair of the State Lands Commission. The lieutenant governor also chairs the California Commission for Economic Development. The Secretary of State is the chief elections officer of the state, responsible for overseeing and certifying elections, as well as testing and certifying voting equipment for use in California. The Secretary of State administers election laws, maintains a database of registered voters, certifies the official lists of candidates for each election, certifies initiatives for placement on the state ballot, publishes the voter information guide before each statewide election, compiles election returns, and publishes the official statement of vote. They also certify election results. The Secretary of State plays a key role in making government open and accessible by providing public access to a wide range of corporate, uniform commercial code, campaign finance, lobbying, and election records. The Secretary maintains online editions of the California Lobbyist Directory and the California roster of federal, state, and local government officials. The Secretary of State's California Business Portal provides online information, resources, and services to business. The Secretary receives, examines, and approves articles of incorporation for new California corporations and qualifies out-of-state and international corporations to do business in California. The Secretary's Business Programs Division also approves amendments to the records of domestic or qualified foreign corporations and registers trademarks, trade names, service marks, and fictitious names. The Secretary is responsible for appointing and commissioning notaries public and oaths of office for non-civil service officers and employees. The Secretary of State maintains the Domestic Partnership Registry, the Advanced Health Care Directive Registry, and the Safe at Home Program. The Secretary of State keeps the complete record of the official acts of the legislature and executive departments of the state government. The Secretary is charged with the custody of the enrolled copy of the Constitution, all acts and resolutions passed by the legislature, the journals of each house, the Great Seal of the State of California, all books, records, deeds, parchments, maps, and papers kept or deposited in the office pursuant to law. As custodian of the public archives, the Secretary maintains and properly equips safe and secure vaults for the preservation of documents placed in their charge. The Secretary of State affixes the Great Seal with their attestation to commissions, pardons, and other public documents that required the Governor's signature. The State Attorney General is charged with uniformly and equally enforcing California's laws and assists district attorneys, local law enforcement, and federal and international criminal justice agencies in the administration of justice. The Attorney General carries out their constitutional responsibilities through the programs of the Department of Justice. The Department's legal programs represent the people in civil and criminal matters before trial, appellate, and the Supreme Courts of California and the United States. In representing the people, the Attorney General protects Californians from fraudulent, unfair, and illegal activities that victimize consumers or threaten the public safety, and enforces laws that safeguard the environment and natural resources. The Attorney General also serves as legal counsel to state officers and, with a few exceptions, to state agencies, boards, and commissions. 
The department's legal programs maintain major law offices in Sacramento, Fresno, San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Diego, which is where your erstwhile instructor got his start after getting out of the Navy was working for the Attorney General's office in San Francisco. That was an education in and of itself. The department's division of law enforcement provides forensic services, narcotic investigations, as well as criminal investigations, intelligence, and training. The Division of California Justice Information Services facilitates the exchange of accurate, timely, and complete criminal justice intelligence using state-of-the-art criminal computer technology. The state controller and the state treasurer often seem like two sides of one coin. The state controller is the chief fiscal officer of the state. The state controller's primary duties are to provide sound fiscal control over both receipts and disbursements of our public funds. So when you get a check cut from the state of California, it's going to be the state controller's signature on it. To report periodically on the financial operations and condition of both state and local governments. Make certain money due to the state is collected through fair, equitable, and effective tax administration. To provide fiscal guidance to local governments. To administer the unclaimed property and property tax postponement programs and to develop and establish policy for a significant number of boards and commissions, including all major tax boards. So again, no money can be drawn from the Treasury unless it is against the appropriation made by law and upon warrants duly drawn by the State Controller. The State Controller supervises the fiscal affairs of the State, suggests plans for the improvement and management of public revenues, keeps all accounts in which the State is interested, and keeps a separate account of each specific appropriation showing at all times the balance of the appropriation. The state controller supervises the state's fiscal concerns and audits all claims against it. The state controller directs the collections of all monies due to the state and, if necessary, is authorized to go to court to recover the property or money owed. The state controller has general supervision over the general procedure for tax sales, tax deeds, and redemptions, and makes necessary rules and regulations relating to the fiscal affairs under their control. The state treasurer is really the state's banker, investor, and the lead asset manager. The treasurer invests monies on behalf of the state government, cities, counties, schools, and other local agencies. The treasurer sells the state's bonds, including voter-approved infrastructure bonds, and administers the state bond program. The treasurer serves on the board of the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, the State Teachers Retirement System, CalSTRS, and the California Housing Finance Agency. California has an insurance commissioner who is responsible for overseeing California's insurance industry and protecting the state's insurance consumers. Insurance in California is a $123 billion a year industry and contributes significantly to the state's economy. So the insurance commissioner leads the California Department of Insurance. The California Department of Insurance ensures that consumers are protected, that the insurance marketplace remains vibrant and stable, and that the law is enforced fairly in an open and equitable regulatory environment. As the head of the largest consumer protection agency in the state, the insurance commissioner enforces the laws of California Insurance Code and promulgates regulations to implement those laws. The commissioner requires the rates of auto, homeowners, and other property and casualty insurance and has saved consumers in business tens of billions of dollars in premiums using that authority. But the commissioner does not have the authority to approve or disapprove health insurance rates or premiums. Finally, the state superintendent of public instruction is the only nonpartisan of the eight statewide constitutional officers in California. The superintendent is accountable to the people of California for administering and enforcing education law and regulations and for continuing to inform and improve public elementary and secondary school programs, adult education, and some preschool and child care programs. The superintendent is the executive officer and secretary of the State Board of Education and the director of the California Department of Education. The Department of Education administers California's public education system at the state level. The CDE's mission is to ensure California will provide a world-class education 
for all students from early childhood to adulthood. The CDE serves our state by innovating and collaborating with educators, schools, parents, and community partners to prepare students to live, work, and thrive in a highly connected world. Thus we turn our attention, having concluded our examination of the legislature and the executive as well as constitutional officers, the, the plural executive that we discussed a moment ago, to the third branch of California state government, which is the courts, or the legal system. I use the term legal system advisedly. The Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 actually created a dual system of courts, national and state. The federal courts deal with matters arising from the U.S. Constitution, civil cases involving regulatory activity, plus a relatively small number of criminal offenses. Fifty separate state systems address matters arising from state constitutions, civil matters, and most criminal offenses. State courts handle the vast majority of all court activity in the nation. California is only one of these 50 systems, but it is not simply a copy of the others. Each state's judiciary reflects to some extent its political, culture, and history, which is why we took such pains to talk about the development of our state's political history. The independent spirit that characterized California's history was bound to be reflected in its legal system. In fact, its Supreme Court has developed a national reputation for independence from the federal judiciary. Unlike many southern states, which used a state's rights philosophy to impede federal civil rights efforts, California courts have viewed independence in progressive terms. The state's independent state grounds doctrine assumed that when state and federal constitutional provisions are similar, California can interpret those provisions more expansively or liberally. This view, pioneered by the late Supreme Court Chief Justice Stanley Mosk, expanded individual rights beyond those guaranteed by the U.S. Supreme Court, a doctrine called independent state grounds. In several celebrated cases, the California Supreme Court struck down the death penalty before its federal counterpart did, rejected the state's method of financing public education, a decision the U.S. Supreme Court refused to make, and invalidated a citizen initiative that would have banned fair housing laws. This exemplifies judicial federalism, the ability and willingness of different court systems to produce potentially diverse, fragmented, or contradictory policy. California's independent-minded judiciary does not operate in a vacuum. Some people prefer to resolve their legal disputes at the federal level. California has four federal district courts located throughout the state. It is possible for state and federal courts to hear the same kind of cases, civil rights, civil liberties, a phenomenon called concurrent jurisdiction. As a result, Californians can shop for the level, federal or state, most likely to give them their desired result. Challenges to voter-approved initiatives have often been filed in federal court. Examples include Prop 187 for immigration, 209 for affirmative action, and Proposition 8 for same-sex marriage. If decisions by the federal district courts in California are appealed, they go to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. This court is famous for its own judicial independence. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court has rebuked the circuit court for frustrating California's efforts to execute death row inmates. More than most federal appellate courts, the Ninth Circuit handles cases involving diverse populations and sweeping social changes. The judges themselves admit that California provides them with a variety of cutting-edge issues because of the state's size, diversity, and its propensity to pass constitutionally vulnerable initiatives. 
Another example, in 2001, they ruled unconstitutional a petty theft sentence under California's three strikes law that I talked about in Chapter 4. This decision involved the theft of some videotapes, was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. Reflecting the region it serves, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the federal court, has been inundated with immigration cases in recent years. So, how are California's courts organized? Well, California's judicial system is the largest in the world, consisting of more than 2,000 judicial officers divided into tiers of courts. These layers divide the judiciary's caseload within the system while allowing ample opportunity for litigants to appeal unfavorable decisions. So let's look briefly at each layer, beginning where most cases start, at the bottom. On the lowest rung of the judicial ladder are the state's trial courts. These courts are triers of fact. They determine who is right in civil disputes and who might be guilty in criminal cases. Until recently, there were both municipal and superior courts. The municipal courts handled minor criminal offenses, punishable by fines or jail time, infractions, finable violations of state statutes or local ordinances, and civil claims of $25,000 or less. In 1998, the, pa the passage of Proposition 220 allowed municipal and superior court functions to merge into the superior courts. All state trial courts are now organized in this manner. In addition to all felony and civil disputes, the superior courts serve as family, juvenile, and probate courts. Depending on the county's size, superior court judges either hear a wide variety of cases or specialize in a particular area of the law, such as juvenile, family, probate, or criminal. They're paid about 144000 a year, not including county-funded benefits. At this level, cases may be decided by juries or only by judges, which are called bench trials. In many cases, defendants opt for jury trials rather than guilty pleas. The law requires more time be spent by judges, juries, and staff who record and assess second and third strike data. Supporting the judges are professional court administrators who manage court personnel, budgets, and workloads. Because more than 30% of criminal arrests in California are illicit drug-related, many counties have established drug treatment courts that combine the standard judicial process with community drug treatment services. The volume of trial court cases in California is staggering. Almost 8 million filings in the last year were handled by trial courts. There are more criminal cases than civil cases, although juvenile and criminal felony cases constitute only 13% of the total, they consume disproportionate resources due to frequent hearings, motions, and jury trials. In addition to court consolidation, California's judiciary has experienced other recent improvements. The 1997 Trial Court Funding Act transferred financial responsibility for the trial courts to the state. The purpose of this law was to stabilize and make more equitable judicial services across the state. Chief Justice Ronald M. George called it, without a doubt, one of the most important reforms in the California justice system in the 20th century. California has also increased court interpreter services, and with good reason. On any given day, more than 100 languages may need translation in the state's courts. Looking then at appellate courts, district courts of appeal hear appeals from the superior courts and the quasi-judicial state agencies. Unlike superior courts, they normally decide questions of law, not of fact. For instance, instead of deciding guilt or innocence in a car theft case, California's 105 appellate justices typically sit on three member panels to determine if legal procedures, due process, were applied properly in that case. If legal errors did occur, they can order a new trial. Although appeals are common, appellate courts dismiss most of them. At that level, there are no trials as such, no witnesses, no juries. The justices read trial court transcripts and occasionally hear oral arguments by opposing attorneys. They spend hours in private legal research, not in the courtroom. 
When they hear cases, they usually sit on as panels of three. Because the California Supreme Court also declines to hear most cases appealed to it, appellate court decisions are often final. Appeals rarely involve life or death, earth-shaking issues. As one California appellate judge put it, if 90% of the stuff were in the United States Post Office, it would be classified as junk mail. <laughs> in the last fiscal year, the Court of Appeals processed over 22,000 filings and disposed of 12,543 matters through written opinions. Only 7% of those were significant enough to meet official criteria for publication. Appellate justices earn about $165,000 a year. Presiding judges earn somewhat more. Turning then finally to the California Supreme Court that has long been eulogized for its contributions to the development of contemporary law, as I mentioned. For example, state courts are explicitly bound by Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution to acknowledge the Constitution, right, the Supremacy Clause, and laws and treaties made under it as the supreme law of the land. But obviously, state courts have their own particular state laws and constitutions to interpret. In California, as in other states, the notion of independent state grounds provides for a separate test of state constitutionality that can differ from the federal standard. This notion of a separate constitutionalism, which combines conventional conservatism and liberal aspirations, gives the California Supreme Court an unusual significance both within the state and on the national scene. According to former Justice Grodin, law students and lawyers are slowly coming to understand that if they have what that if they have what they regard as a constitutional issue, it is their responsibility to look first to the state constitution. Yet such contrariness, which some commentators would call independence or creativity, should not be unexpected given the history of California and of California's court. As provided for by the Constitution of 1849, the California Supreme Court was to consist of a chief justice and two associate justices elected by the state legislature or by the people in contested elections for a term of six years, which was later lengthened to 10 years. Early Justice Stephen Field, a Democrat, was appointed by Abraham Lincoln to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1863. Today, the California Supreme Court is composed of seven justices who serve for 12-year terms. Its formal powers have expanded, and its political character is even more pronounced. The judiciary's formal powers, including those of the Supreme Court, are described in Article 6 of the California State Constitution. The court has original jurisdiction in a narrow range of cases, and its major impact is as an appellate court reviewing the state court's appeal decisions that are appealed to it. The procedure is similar to that of the U.S. Supreme Court, which spends much of its time deciding which cases to hear. The California Constitution requires its Supreme Court to review all death penalty cases. The court may also review the recommendations of the Commission on Judicial Performance, a body of various judges and citizens, and of the State Bar of California, concerning the removal and suspension of judges and attorneys for misconduct. Judges are nominated by the governor after their qualifications are reviewed by the State Bar Association's Judicial Nominations Evaluation Commission. Nominees must then be confirmed by the Commission on Judicial Appointments. Thus, the state legislature is bypassed. The Commission on Judicial Appointments consists of the Chief Justice, the Attorney General, and the Presiding Justice of the Court of Appeal of the affected district, or, when a nomination or appointment to the Supreme Court is to be considered, the Presiding Justice who has presided longest in any Court of Appeal. If a Justice is filling a retiring Justice's term, he or she must run for election at the next gubernatorial election for a 12-year term. The elections have become increasingly divisive, as the numbers of those voting for removal have increased. Having reviewed, then, the three branches of government at the California state level, that is, the legislature, the executive, 
and the judiciary, we now turn our attention to local government, counties and cities specifically. As I'm going to mention, one of the key differences between the national and the state is that at the national level, we do have a federal system. We remember going back to our chapter three conversation, the differences between unitary, federal, and confederal. If it's the case that at the national level, we have a federal system, at the state level, we truly have a unitary system. De Tocqueville believed that he had discovered the essence of democracy in America. The ghost in the American machine was the principle of equality. It was everywhere and nowhere, moving through a myriad of political institutions. He said, quote, the laws differ and, that, and their outward features change, but the same spirit animates them, quote. This spirit has no less a goal than the leveling of all differences, especially those of opinion. This would lead to the development of a centralized administration that would implement a soft despotism in the United States. One of the potential bulwarks against the rising tide of soft despotism would be local self-government. From his observations of New England town meetings, de Tocqueville argued that a certain degree of local autonomy helped to foster a spirit of civic duty. When considering matters of local government, citizens could more easily notice that their immediate welfare was intimately tied to the welfare of their community. Visceral self-interest could be, in this way, transformed into self-interest rightly understood. If this spirit were to become predominant, America might avoid being dominated by a democratic, centralized administration. If de Tocqueville were to examine the condition of local government in California today, he would find that the local government of California is a maze of cities, counties, regional associations, local agency formation committees, school districts, and other special districts. This is hardly what de Tocqueville, not to mention the founding fathers, had in mind. So, we begin with our examination of counties. There are 58 counties in California. Each county is a legal entity of the state of California and is governed by a five-member board of supervisors. Most of the counties elect their supervisors by means of a single-member district system similar to that of the ward system in city government. The primary areas of the primary areas of policy responsibility for counties are public health, public records, sanitation, a sheriff's department, and welfare. For the most part, county policy responsibilities, including the costs of running the court system, are mandated by the state or federal government. Counties provide approximately 60% of the funding for the state's court system. In addition, some counties have contracts with local governments within their jurisdiction to share the cost for certain services. This is called the Lakewood Plan, after that California city that initially adopted this method of providing services. The most common policy areas that fall under the Lakewood Plan are fire and police services. Most counties in California belong to regional associations. These organizations are quasi-governmental units devoted to cooperation and discussion on issues of regional concern, with mass transit being a prominent example. We remember our Chapter 7 discussion about the Association of Bay Area Governments. Counties within a regional association send representatives to serve on a board of directors, share research data, conduct studies, and resolve inter-county disputes. The two largest associations are the Southern California Association of Governments and, as I suggest, the Association of Bay Area Governments. The Southern California Association is formed by representatives from Imperial, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, 
and Ventura counties. The Bay Area group comprises representatives of Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, Napa, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Solano counties. There are 482 cities in California, and they have primary or shared responsibility for implementing policies in the following areas. Police, fire, streets, sewage, storm drainage, sanitation, planning, and zoning. According to state law, there are two basic types of city, general law cities and charter cities. A general law city is governed according to specific provisions in the California Code, but a charter city has more flexibility in its management of administration and fiscal affairs. The city council is the basic institution of government for California cities. City councils contain at least five members elected to staggered four-year terms, and their elections can be based on either the ward system or, at, or the at-large system. The ward system operates much like elections to the California legislature, with council members being elected from single-member districts or wards within the city, geographic expressions. On the other hand, council members in an at-large system do not represent a specific district within the city. Instead, the entire council is selected in a single citywide election. For example, if a city council were to have five members, the top five candidates in a citywide election would serve on the council regardless of the neighborhood in which they lived. Mayors can be directly elected by the city at large or selected by the council from among its members. A mayoral position can either be weak or strong. Strong mayors have extensive powers to hire and fire city officials, and weak mayors lack these powers but fulfill a ceremonial role. All but the largest cities, which include Los Angeles and San Francisco, employ a city manager as the chief municipal administrative officer. The job of the city manager, sometimes called a city administrator, is to run a city's day-to-day -day operations and monitor its finances. Since the city manager serves at the pleasure of the city council, their level of flexibility is a barometer of the balance of power between a mayor and a city council. Weak mayor cities are often called council manager governments, and strong mayor cities are often referred to as mayor council governments. So juxtaposing cities in California, we can ask these questions. Each city is compared according to whether or not the city has a charter, its method of electing a city council, the strength of the office of mayor, and whether or not there is a city manager. Los Angeles is at one extreme with a mayor-council form of government, while the small Kings County city of Lemoore is the quintessential council manager city. At-large elections and the employment of city managers are institutions again dating from the progressive era, the 1880s to the 1920s. We remember, seems so long ago now, that the goal of progressivism, led in California by Governor Hiram Johnson, was to end the patronage style of governments instituted by large city political machines. The spoil system was to be replaced with a more rational, bureaucratic style of rule. How might de Tocqueville have responded to this political expression? Well, in one sense, de Tocqueville would probably side with public choice theorists. He argued that the main contribution to democracy by a strong system of local government is the opportunity to inculcate the citizens with proper understanding of self-interest. Well, perhaps the fragmentation of California government isn't a bad thing in and of itself. The breakup of large cities into smaller ones can perhaps provide a smaller and more natural environment in which patriotic transformation of citizens' souls can take place. In another sense, however, de Tocqueville might agree with the administrative rationalists. The patriotic transformation that took place in New England towns that we talked about in chapters 1 and 2, partly because of the citizens' natural connection to a place with an identifiable 
character. The properly functioning local government is, quote, so constituted, quote, so constituted as to excite the warmest of human affections without arousing the ambitious passions of the hearts of men, close quote. Therefore, the chaotic local government structure in California provides a fertile field for the expansion of pluralism. Which brings us to our conclusion today, my friends, which is our seminar question. To reiterate, what elements of California local and state government seem different from those at the national level? What elements seem different? What do you imagine would account for these differences? So as I said in the beginning, the main driver is the distinct political culture of California, in addition to the progressive era reforms of the early 1900s. These two elements are diverse political makeup and how we, as a local citizenry, deign to conduct our public affairs, make us vastly different as a laboratory of democracy in the United States. Now, this being the final, I'm going to eschew helping you create a thesis statement for this. My friends, if you don't know how to do it by now, <laughs> I have failed and I have failed miserably. Just remember to create a declarative statement, knock off everything that smells like a question, and from that create your outline. As with all our essays, even though this is the final and worth more points, I'm asking you to squeeze this into the usual two and a half to three page spread. My friends, this is the last lecture. There is one more small YouTube clip called The Peroration, which is not graded. It's there for your edification and your enjoyment and for me to thank you for your attention and your hard work this semester. And so I will leave you with that. For the last time, <laughs> this is Mike Corelli with the Introduction to United States Government Online. Thank you. Go get them. <laughs>